A very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our September webinar, Finding Future Growth Stocks in a Time of Turmoil. But I hope you're all having a good day across Australia today. Now, it is important to know that today's presentation does not constitute any personal advice. This is just general uh, advice. So we do not know your personal circumstances. In that case, we cannot offer you any personal advice. Now, the information contained in this uh, presentation is public sources. We will mention a few stocks. Neither the presenters today are offering this as any advice. Today's speakers, we've got Greg Carnarvon. He is a managing editor at The Daily Reckoning. Greg is also the author of Crisis and Opportunity. And the second presenter we have today is none other than a co-founder of Scaffold and Scaffold's general manager. He's a Chris Batchelor. He's our chartered financial analyst. So we'll get straight into it, gentlemen. Over the last 12 months, we have had some trends or some general events. The media has talked about the market crushing. We've had some horror shocks and warnings and a bit of a buzz. I'll start off with you, Chris. If you can just generally walk us through what events happened during the year. Thanks for that, Shepard. As you just mentioned, August was indeed a very volatile time on the ASX. In fact, it was the worst month we've seen since the GFC. And so far, September has continued in that vein. Of course, the downside of all this is if you, if you hold shares, then you're probably seeing a decline in the value of your portfolio. But there is an upside, and that is that if you have cash available, there may be some more investment opportunities starting to emerge. So, Shepard, getting on to what you were saying about iron ore, iron ore price has indeed fallen considerably over the last year or so. It fell from its peak of around $140 to a low of $40 in July, and it's since rebounded a bit to about $57. Last year, steel consumption in China actually fell. That's the first time that's happened in the last 30 years. And whilst that's happening, supply is continuing to increase. All of that means that the big producers of iron ore, Rio, BHP and Fortescue, have been hard hit. Also, of course, the small producers are being hit even harder, and some of them are barely viable at these levels, the likes of Atlas Iron and Mount Gibson. There's considerable collateral damage to other companies as well, the one, those that service this, this mining sector. Thanks, Shepard. All right, Chris, uh, look, very quickly, let's move on to the next trend that happened. Let's talk about the oil prices. What effect have those had on the market? Yeah, sure, Shepard. What we've seen again with oil in a similar vein to um, iron ore is that the price has halved. It's gone from around $100 to $50 uh, or thereabouts over the last 12 months. And just uh, this week, Goldman Sachs have released a report saying that oil could fall as low as $20. Now, that's a worst case scenario, but nevertheless, it, it's worth bearing in mind that we haven't necessarily hit the bottom. Now, what that means, of course, is that any business that's uh, listed on the ASX and impacted by oil is going to be uh, impacted significantly, and you know, particularly the, the big oil producers, and in, again, the smaller oil producers are getting hit even harder. And then there's a flow-on effect. With all of these resource companies, you know, they make up a considerable part of the Australian economy, and there's not only those companies themselves, but a whole lot of companies that service them, what we you know, often refer to as the uh, resource servicing companies, and they're being impacted significantly as as the producers find their margins being squeezed. They have less money available to invest in projects, so you know construction firms and the like are getting impacted, and it can even have a flow-on effect to the broader economy. Of course, with oil, though, as opposed to iron ore, um, there are a number of businesses that have oil as an input, and so for those businesses, a falling oil price is indeed a good thing. Awesome. Hey, Chris, I would like to switch over all the way up to Europe. Now, um, we've known or heard of some people from up in Greece that were down in Australia for holiday when the Greece meltdown happened. How does how that affect us, and how close are we to it? Well, really, Shepard, you know, the, all the turmoil in Greece, it, it's devastating for the Greeks, and indeed any company that's highly exposed to Greece. But the reality is that aside from some short-term effects on sentiment, there's actually not much of a direct impact on the ASX and ASX stocks. What we can sometimes see, though, is volatility creates fear. 
and fear can create opportunities where stocks get sold off that really aren't going to be impacted by um, events in Greece in the long term, but you know people reacting to that sell off these stocks, and that can present a, an opportunity for those that have the the uh, stomach to to get in there. You know, great businesses are those that can weather the storms, and usually this comes down to the specifics of the business rather than global events. That is awesome. Look, now I'd like to bring in Greg, who's signing in from Melbourne. Greg, good afternoon. Good day, Shepard. How are we? Not too bad. Hey, Greg. The fourth trend I just want to uh, to cover today is uh, the Chinese stock market. How 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 close are we to that? The Chinese stock market is um, uh, an entity unto itself, but I guess looking at it in the context of how it affects Australia, um, you've you've got to look at um, how it, I guess, has worked in with the, the bigger picture of what's happening in China. So uh, China started a slowdown um, probably back in 2011, had a massive credit boom post-2008 when it was under a lot of pressure from the, the slowdown in the West. So it... Um, generated a massive stimulus program. It caused a huge boom in iron ore prices, commodity prices in general. It was very good for Australia, but its growth um, started to slow down from 2011. So pretty much from that time, China has been attempting to rebalance, stimulate, slow down, stimulate, rebalance its economy um, without going back into a boom type phase. And they've they've been very hit and miss with that, that strategy. And, and they inflated a big property bubble, and when that started to slow down, they tried to put their stimulus in towards the stock market, which created another bubble there, and now that is, is coming undone. The effect is not so much directly related to Australia rather than the, the bigger picture slowdown in, in the Chinese economy, which when Chris spoke before about the iron ore price, iron ore prices peaked in 2011, they've been falling ever since, and that is obviously directly related to China. So. The, the effect on the Aussie economy isn't so much coming from the Chinese stock market as coming from the, the Chinese economy itself. And look, we're going to see for another number of years China's um, attempt to restructure and rebalance its economy away from very commodity intensive fixed asset investment growth more towards a consumption based society. And that, you know, that's not going to be without its problems. Okay, thanks, Greg. Now, look, very quickly, this morning I woke up to some news about Thursday being the day that we hear about the interest rates in the U.S., which will be our Friday morning. Just briefly, the rising interest rates, how worried or concerned should we be? No, I don't – the market's making a, a, a massive big deal of this, um, but personally, I, do, I don't think it's a huge issue. We've seen the market adjust over the past 12 to 18 months from the day that Ben Bernanke stopped – uh, quantitative easing, which I think was in, in 2013 at some point. Um, so th this has been a long time coming. Whether it happens tomorrow or overnight or not, I, I think is beside the point. It's probably going to happen at some point in the next few months. Um, and look, m markets do adjust to these to these moves, and whether that means we've had the most of the adjustment now or whether there's a little bit more of an adjustment to go. But I, I don't think it's it's as big an issue as the um, the markets or the, the commentary is making it out to be now. Sure, it's the first interest rate rise in nearly 10 years in the US, um, which gives you an indication of how much stimulus has been through the US and the global economy. But look, I think we should be able to manage a, a 25 basis point rise without without too much uh, too many too many problems. I've got three graphs that I'm going to talk to show you. Uh, we've heard Chris talk about oil prices and what, what he feels uh, is going to affect. And we're looking at the uh, crude oil price from back in 2014. We saw it fall from about 110 down to about 44. This is going about a day ago when I took this chart. The next graph I want us to have a quick look at is the uh, U.S. Uh, Fed funds, which is the U.S. interest rates. As you can see there, they started dropping off late 2007 into 2008. We haven't heard or seen an increase since mid-2009, up until, well, we, we don't know as yet, but up until we hear what they have to say today. And the last one, which uh, Greg mentioned as well, is just the Chinese stock market. We've seen it go up and peak up until uh, April, April, May this year, and it started to come down. I guess the question I have for our attendees today is um, quite simply, I'll just run a quick poll and find out, I want to find out 
which of these trends you guys think will actually impact the ASX most over the next 12 months? So we've got a few votes going on. We've got about half the attendees, half of the 500 people that are with us today voting. So we're waiting for the other half. It looks like 39% of our attendees today are saying the rising US interest rates will impact the ASX market the most. Very few people think uh, the commodities will be affected by oil prices. It looks like everyone thinks our neighbors up north, China, will uh, impact this ASX the most. Greg, let us know which stock do you think will be impacted uh, the most by the Chinese stock market or which, which, finance, which industry? And then if you can actually be stock specific, that would be brilliant. Sure. Uh, okay, in terms of the, the industry, I think uh, the industry most at risk from, and when we talk about the Chinese stock market, remember I'm, I'm talking about the, probably more the, the Chinese economy um, as well, and, and as much as the Chinese stock market represents the economy, we'll, we'll just group it together. But I do think the, the big risk for Australia is in the banking sector. Um, the reason why I say that is when I was talking before, the Chinese economy has been slowing down for, well, nearly four years now. The initial slowdown was felt in the resources sector, so you saw um, you know the big big miners, iron ore price, coal prices falling. Uh, the the, mi the mines and metal index um, has fallen about 60% from its peak. So we've already seen that the China slowdown has had a big impact on the um, on the the commodity sector. I think it does take a, a, a long time for that to work its way through into the I guess the heart of the economy, which is the banking sector. And Australia is a very financialized economy and. Part of the off, offset of the China slowdown has been lower interest rates, which is, has ignited a housing boom in Australia, and that's created a big demand for finance, a big demand for financial services, um, mortgage growth, and obviously the banks are very exposed to that and have done very well over the past few years from lower, lower interest rates and higher house prices. In my view, if China does continue to slow and slows more than what the, the market currently thinks, um, and the last couple of months, I think the market has probably sat up and taken a lot more notice of China than what it has in, in previous years. And in previous years, the view has been that Chinese authorities know what they're doing, they'll do a managed slowdown. And I think that attitude started to change in the past couple of months. Um, my view is that that'll affect the banks purely because of the, the, the lag flow through of lower Chinese growth, lower income growth um, on Australia's national income, which will at some point sap demand for um, rising house prices and, and demand for financial services. Now, when I talk about the banks, I always like to look at the biggest bank, which is the Commonwealth, uh, to see how it is affecting the, the sector. And if you look at the share price of Commonwealth Bank, most people would probably be familiar that the, the share price has moved from... I think around ninety six dollars um, back in the peak of March to it's around about seventy four dollars today. So it, there's been a, there's been a decent move um, in in the in the Commonwealth Bank share price. You've also got APRA's regulatory controls kicking in, which means they're going to need to hold more capital, which means more shares on issue. Um, and I think the biggest risk going forward is whether the banks can maintain those strong dividends that they've been churning out for the past couple of years. If there is any increase in bad debts, if there's any increase or, or slowdown in, in revenue growth, um, then I think the banks are at risk of having to maybe pare back their, their dividends a little bit um, and that will have an effect on share prices. So what we've seen in the past few months, share, bank share prices are now in a downtrend. Um, I take that as being that the, the bank bull market is over for the time being and the market's reassessing their growth prospects. Um, and if you do see weaker than expected growth in China, if you do see more concern about China's authorities to manage their slowdown, uh, I think the banking sector will be the uh, main sector that takes the, takes the brunt of those concerns. Generally, Shepard, I do share those same sentiments. However, you know, just to provide a bit of variety, I will focus in on a, on a different industry. Um, I agree with Greg's sentiment that really what we're talking about here is more the the Chinese uh, economy than the stock market per se. The, the volatility on the Chinese stock market is not really going to have a huge direct impact on businesses in Australia, but to the extent that that reflects a declining confidence in this Chinese economy, then that can indeed have an impact. 
uh, I noticed just last weekend some data was released that showed the, the slowest growth in fixed asset investment for 15 years in China. Uh, what that means, of course, is that demand for raw materials is being reduced and companies that are earning a lot of their revenue by selling into China may indeed by, be affected by that as they have been over the last couple of years, but I, I see that that may well continue into the future. So if I can go into Scaffold now and maybe just pull up that old chestnut BHP and have a bit of a look, you know, just as a bit of a bellwether as to how this um, trend may well be impacting on, on the Australian stock market, which of course BHP makes up a, a big part of, of our main indices. Um, so what I'll do here, Shepard, is I'll just flick over to the earnings of BHP and what you can see there immediately is that from 2011 onwards the earnings have been in a, in a steady decline and indeed they're forecast to continue declining through into 2016. Then uh, analysts are saying that it'll start to turn around. Looking at that, there's a couple of things that stand out to me. One, of course, is just the obvious trend, which is a, a negative one, a declining one. But a key point is if we look here at these forecast figures, you can see those sort of uh, golden coloured halos. And what they represent are the minimums and the maximum forecasts for these um, uh, earnings in the coming year. So you can see that, for example, in 2016, there's an average forecast of $1.06, but that it ranges from $0.40 cents through to $2.17. And likewise, in the following years, there's a, a very wide spread in those forecasts. And what that says to me, and there's 20 analysts covering this stock, so it's not just the opinion of one or two people. Um, what that says to me is that really there's an awful lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen in the coming years. And when you've got that level of uncertainty, that's going to uh, impact, you know, it's risk. <laughs> There's no other word for it. it. It represents a high level of risk. Um, so, you know, whilst the analysts are saying that it may well turn around in 2017 and 18, there's a fair bit of um, uncertainty associated with that. If we go across here to the capital history screen, you can see the return on equity, which is represented by this blue line. Again, it's been declining considerably. Uh, it, it's forecast for 2016 to come in at 6.6%. Um, obviously not a very attractive number. So I, I think, you know, whilst we, we've already seen a major impact from China on the, the resource stocks, I think that trend is quite likely to continue for a while yet. And the other thing I was going to just highlight to people, if I go across here to this forecast updates chart, what this is showing us is the change in analysts' for well, not the change in analysts' forecast, but the change in valuations, which uh, are largely being driven by those analysts' forecasts. And you can see over the course of the last 12 months that has clearly been declining. Um, so that orange line that goes across the page represents the the valuation at the different points in time over the last 12 months and the sort of grey shading represents the share price. And it's a very clear trend that analysts' expectations have been lowering um, steadily throughout the year. And there's you know, a reasonably good likelihood that those expectations will continue to fall uh, in the foreseeable, well, over the next little while at least. So that to me is um, you know, one of the great areas of risk coming out of China. Okay. Well, look, very, very quickly, I just want to turn uh, my attention to a question from one attendee. Alan says, a small percentage of the Chinese people actually invest in their stock market. Why then is the market so volatile? I'll, I'll make a few comments and maybe Greg would like to add to it. One of the things is that it's, the Chinese stock market is driven uh, by retail investors. In um, Australia and, and in many developed markets, there's a much greater proportion of institutional investors in the market. And what that tends to mean is a, I hesitate to use the word, but a, a higher level of maturity when it comes to investing. You know, one of the things that we witness in, in China is that there tends to be a bit of a get on board, things are looking great, you, you, you mustn't miss out. And then that quickly flicks to panic, run away, oh no, the, the sky is falling type of sentiment. 
Um, and, and hence you see those great uh, volatility. And you know that the picture that you put up earlier, Shepherds, kind of really summed it up with the that gentleman with the expression on his face of sheer terror as as the market was plunging before his eyes. Yeah, look, I'd I'd agree with that completely. And the analogy I'd probably use is that people look at the Chinese stock market in more more like a casino to try and make a quick buck rather than a, a long term wealth generating machine, which you know I guess it's seen to be in in more developed markets. Um, by the majority of people. So, yeah, I agree with that completely. Well, gentlemen, I would like to turn our attention to the now. How has the reporting season affected the market and how do our attendees go about finding good stocks to invest in? Well, I guess the, the first thing to point out is that I've been using Scaffold for a number of years. Um, I'm a big fan of the way it uh, calculates intrinsic value. I think it makes complete and utter, utter sense. One of the additional tools that I use, um, I guess, to complement the fundament fundamental analysis is to look at the chart. So <clears throat> what I mean by that is not getting anything or not becoming too technical with the charts. I don't use any special buy and sell indicators, but purely I'm looking to see whether a stock is in an uptrend or whether it's in a downtrend. And one of the basic rules I use, I certainly want to buy stocks that are, that are cheap around intrinsic value, below intrinsic value, uh, or just mispriced by the market. If I think they've got better growth potential than what the market thinks, I want to buy stocks that are that are uh, a re good relative value. But often, if a stock is in a nasty downtrend or or in a downtrend at all, I, I won't I won't recommend it or I won't buy it. And that's purely trying to recognise the fact that you can fall into value traps sometimes. So there might be stocks that look like they're really good value. You think that they're a good buy. Um, but there's some things going on that analysts don't see. There's some things going on that are just not out in the news. But the share <clears throat> and the share market is a great forecaster of future uh, future conditions. Um, and probably 80, 90 percent of the time, if a if a stock falls on no news, um, it generally means there might be some bad news coming out. So what I try to do to increase the probability of of picking a a good stock is to buy a cheap stock and buy it when it's in an uptrend and when I say an uptrend, I'm talking about when certain moving averages that I use are trending higher, um, which indicates that the main trend of the stock is is moving higher. And, and generally, when stocks are in an uptrend, it means that um, that earnings prospects are good. It means that there's good things going on with the company. That insiders are, are clearly happy with how things are going. There's no negative news leaks. There's no um, Worries about future earnings, and it's and it's generally a sign that good things are going on. Chris, how do you go about this? One of the things that is key in times of turmoil, indeed in any time, but particularly in times of turmoil, you need a disciplined process. You know, what I, I might just sort of um, add on to what 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 uh, Greg was saying there, which is that you know he uses uh, scaffold as his one of his key inputs to uh, make. Um, to, you know, to help him look for valuations of stocks, and he also uses um, share price charts. What, what you could maybe describe that as? It, we, you talked about following trends, and um, people talk about momentum investing. And um, there's been some interesting studies done which show that if you can combine momentum investing with value investing, it's actually a, a very uh, good strategy, and, and has been very fruitful for a lot of people. So anyway, moving on from that, what I'm going to do now, Shepard, is go over into scaffold and then just have a look at a, a couple of different things. Now, we talk about some of these trends that are impacting the markets, China, the US interest rates, etc. The key thing in my view is that if you can find good quality businesses, then in the long run those stocks will go up and they will prevail. Sure, they will be impacted by some of these uh, broader trends, but in the long run it's about the, the fundamentals of that business. Now we've set up this uh, portfolio for May Magazine back in um, January, and I just thought it was worth highlighting that that portfolio is now up 5.1%, which is nice, not incredible, but nice for you know, eight or nine months. You can see it was a lot higher earlier in the year. Uh, that compares quite favourably with the All Lords Accumulation Index, which is down one and a half percent, so you know, over six percent, uh, nearly seven percent outperformance there. And if we look at this uh, portfolio or this um, process that we've been following now for four years, 
you can see that that portfolio is up, what is 83%, and that compares over the same period with the All Lords Accumulation Index um, with, of 44%, so pretty much double what the All Lords has done. $50,000 now, which we, you know, hypothetically we started with $50,000, it's now worth about $90,000. So you know, that, that's all interesting. I guess the question is, well, where are we today and, and how would we, if we were building this portfolio today, how might we go about it? So what I want to do, Shepard, is um, highlight how, how I would go about it if I was doing that. And where I would start is with the filter tool here in Scaffolds. You can see there I've clicked on the little uh, filter. And what I've done, I've set up a filter um, ahead of time just to save a bit of time. Uh, with some key settings, and I'll just quickly run through what those key settings are, just to make it um, easy for people to follow. Now, you, you know here at Scaffold, we focus on the Scaffold score, which is a, a key metric that measures the quality of businesses and, and their performance. Now, we're looking at um, here A1 through to A3 and B1 and B2 stocks in this portfolio. Now we're looking for companies with low levels of debt, less than 40%. We're looking for companies that are showing um, future growth, so the, the change in their intrinsic value is forecast to be greater than 2%. Uh, we don't want stocks that have zero value. We're sticking with stocks that have analyst coverage because we have more certainty around their, their forecasts and their future. Um, we're also wanting, well, ideally we want a positive safety margin, but at, at the very least we'll want um, you know, only a small premium, so we've said you know, no more than 20% premium in this case. Now that has brought us a list of 28 stocks. Now what's interesting, as I alluded to earlier on in the um, presentation, when we ran this uh, you know, at the start of the year, there was less than 10 stocks, I think it was 6 or 7 from memory, that came up in this filter. So a lot more stocks are now coming um, you know, it's starting to look like possible opportunities. Uh, of course, the question that always arises, and, and one of our listeners has posted the question, where, where will the market go next? Will it go up or down? Um, my crystal ball doesn't work that well, so I'm not going to attempt to answer that. However, if it does go down, it will present more opportunities or perhaps the opportunities are sufficiently good now. That's the kind of assessment you've got to make. The way I look at investing is, am I satisfied with the uh, opportunity as it stands today? I don't know what opportunities will be available tomorrow, but I do know what's available today, and so I make my judgments based on that. So looking at this list, um, 28 stocks is probably a few too many, so what I'll do, I'll just narrow it down a little bit, and to do that I will i uh, remove the A3 stocks, so that'll uh, refine it a bit, and I'll apply that. And then I'll um, just have a look at what we've got. Now, you can see here that we've got all these different columns, and we've now got 18 stocks. Now, one of the things you can do with this table, which is pretty handy, is you can choose which columns you want to look at. So I might just um, get rid of a couple just to clear up some space, but also I'll add in um, this one here, funding surplus total, and I'll explain to you in a minute exactly what that is. So, so now you know, I've got a, a smaller group of, of columns here. Now you can see this funding surplus total. What that means is that over the period that we're looking at, for most companies that'll be 10 years unless they've been listed shorter, has this company generated more cash than it's needed or has it generated uh, less cash than it's needed? And what that means, if it's generated less cash than what it's required, then it's had to find the additional cash somewhere, which means usually uh, an, either an equity capital raising or a debt raising. Right? So you can see, looking at this, and I can just sort by that field, that um, you know, a lot of these stocks do indeed have a, a surplus, but there are also some that have a, um, a deficit. You know, one, for example, REA Group. You can see there, that's a pretty small deficit, only $3 million. In the context of a $5 billion company, you might not worry about that. It's, it's pretty small. But just, just to be um, you know, even tighter on my criteria, I'll add that as an additional criteria. So what I can do here is 
add a criteria to this filter, uh, go down, there's a whole range, of something like 30 different metrics that we can choose from here and I'll pull out this one here, funding surplus total and I'll say has a surplus, right? So I'll save that and this should get us down to, I'm guessing around 10, yeah, 11 stocks, okay? That's how I would go about getting a short list of stocks that I would then be interested in exploring further to see where the opportunities might lie and we might return to that shortly. Thanks, Shepard. Thanks for giving us that overview, Chris. I'd like to just uh, focus on reporting season again. Now, we've obviously come and gone, but Greg, I'll start off with you. Which one stock do you think stood out through the noise and through the trends uh, of reporting season that you sort of like, uh, that caught your eye throughout the, the last two months or so? Sure. Thanks, Shepard. <clears throat> well, firstly, let me say I, um, I certainly didn't go through all the all the results. So um, whether this is the one the one company or not, I don't really know. But one of the stocks that I have followed before reporting season, I, I recommended it, I think back in back in April, something like that. Um, that did report a good result, uh, and its share price has held up very well um, despite the volatility that's gone on in the last couple of months. Is a company called uh, Simic. Uh, now that used to be the old Leighton, Leighton's Holdings and it rebranded itself um, probably late April, or early May. Um, the reason why I like this stock, um, it, fundamentally there's a number of reasons. It's not a standout cheap stock, it's not the cheapest stock on the market, um, but it has had a change of ownership and uh, it is majority owned by um, a Spanish group that um, last year or a couple of years ago bought out uh, a German German group called Hochtief. Uh, they did a complete restructure of Hochtief and had a really good impact or influence on the share price over there. Uh, and they're effectively taking over Simic in a in a similar manner by taking a majority majority stake in Hochtief, which had a which had a, a major shareholding in Simic Group. So the the management teams all changed. Uh, Leighton Holdings, as it was known um, previously, uh, had a lot of issues with with management. Um, and if anyone knows anything about large contracting groups, then it's all about the quality of management and their ability to execute on large projects. So I think um, after a number of years of, of going, ha having some bad results, um, poor financial um, management, all those sorts of things, I think uh, th this company is a, a good turnaround candidate. And if you look at the share price chart there, which I think we've got as well, I'll be able to... Um, I guess talk listeners through the the reasons why I like <clears throat> or how, how I combine the charts with the um, with the fundamentals. So as you can see that there's two little lines on that chart, a blue line and a and a gold or a yellow line. Um, that's the 50 day and the 100 day moving average. Uh, as you can see, the 50 day moving average is above the 100 day moving average, which in my definition says the stock is is in an uptrend and that's been in existence for for nearly a year now. Um, and obviously, obviously, you can see the general trend there is, is moving higher. Now, that's despite the, the considerable volatility the markets uh, displayed, and even though the share price has been volatile as well, the overall trend is moving higher. If you looked at this over 10 years, you would have, you would have seen a share price that was up around the the forty forty dollar mark 10 years ago. That fell all the way to fifteen dollars, and then now we're we're turning back around. So. Uh, the results that came out for this company at the start of reporting season were solid. They weren't outstanding by any by any means, but the new management team's only just recently sort of taken taken over the business. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, there's some asset asset sales plan which could potentially improve the balance sheet um, more and improve profitability, and and by that I mean return on equity. So I think there's there's some hidden value in this, and there's some potential potentially really good upside. And and as long as that share price trend stays you know, steadily moving higher, um, then that tells me that the market believes that story as well. And I think, um, you know, in the next 12 months, you're going to see a, a big move higher in the stock. Hey, Greg, very quickly, uh, I'm just going to take you a step back. You mentioned the moving averages when you're talking about CIMIC, and uh, Ronald asked a question here. Uh, he said, uh, when it comes to moving average, do you use 20, 50, 100, or 200 days? Look, as you see by this um, this chart, um, and, and all the charts I use pretty much is a 50-day and a 100-day. A lot of people use 200 days and 50 days. Um, 
I use 50 and 100. And when the 50 day is higher than the 100 day, uh, and, and when that has been in existence for a little while or when it's crossed over, based on the shares, if the share price is, is moving out to new highs as well, then that tells you that the trend is improving and that the market is warming to the story. So as far as I, as far as I use, it's the 50 and 100 day moving average. All right, awesome. Chris, uh, very quickly, which, which stock do you feel st stood throughout the uh, trends? Okay, thanks for that, Shepard. What I'm going to do is pick a stock which has come up in a couple of times in what I've just been talking about, and that is Nick Scarly. Uh, Nick Scarly is a furniture retailer, as most of you would know. When I produced this table, if you like, based on the filters, and if I sort by forecast change in value, lo and behold, Nick Scarly is at the top. Nick Scarly was also in our money uh, portfolio at the start of this year, if I just quickly refer to that, and you can see that it's actually up 34% since the beginning of the year. So it's been doing really well. Um, quick disclosure, I own it personally. What are some of the key things that we can um, ascertain about Nick Scarly? What we'll do, we'll just click on the stock here and this will load um, what we call the evaluate screens and I'll go firstly to this uh, summary page, the fur furthest to the left. And you can immediately see that there's a whole lot of green ticks down the left hand side and, and there's one red cross. The red cross is that there's less than five analysts that uh, provide coverage for this stock. There's some but there's less than five. You can see on the, on the green side, excellent profitability, earnings are growing. Cash exceeds debt, so they, 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 well, they do use debt, but they always have more cash in the bank than they have debt. Their long-term cash flow has been very strong. The funding surplus that I talked about earlier, they indeed are generating a surplus, which means they have more cash that they're um, generating in the business than, than their requirements. They've also got great forecasts for earnings, and the the analysts, whilst there's not too many of them, they, they're generally in agreement as to what those forecasts should be. So you know, lots of positive attributes. What I also just want to highlight as we look at these is that the way Scaffold works, for each business you know, we'll pull out this summary page, but we don't necessarily pull out the same attributes. The, um, the algorithms that uh, underpin Scaffold will we'll dig into the business and look for key metrics to, to highlight on this page. So for some stocks there'll be quite a number of um, key points being highlighted, for others there will only be a few and obviously for some there will be lots of positives and for others there will be lots of negatives, you know which ones I prefer. So you know, in Nick Scarley's recent results we saw that revenue was up 10% and profits were up 20%, so that, that's very encouraging obviously, same store, same store sales increased and they also opened um, seven new stores, including expanding into Western Australia. They've managed to increase their market share in what is an environment where consumers have been quite cautious. I'm sure most people are aware that you know, the economy is uh, it's, it's not declining, but it's certainly not growing at a rapid pace. I think GDP is you know, around the 2% sort of mark at the moment. Um, there's a, there's a bit, been a bit of a turn down in consumer sentiment. But you know, this business is managing to, to really uh, maintain its market share and indeed grow its market share despite that. And that comes down to the argument that we were making earlier, Shepard, which is that it really is about finding great businesses and great businesses will weather the storm. Obviously, profitable, uh, you know, great circumstances help with great businesses, but in bad, you know, difficult times, what can quite often happen is that the competitors of, of, of the great business find it difficult and may indeed have to close their doors and then when the, the good businesses come out the other side of that difficult time, they're in an even stronger position than they were going into it. Um, this business has been around for quite some time. If we just look here at the capital history screen, you can see 10 years of history there. And this chart, you know, it's, it's a really encouraging chart when you're looking at a business because what it says to you is that over a long period of time, these guys have proven that they know how to run a business, right? That includes the period of the GFC. Um, it includes some, you know, some good years, but it also includes some tough years. But throughout that whole period, 
the equity in the business has continued to rise, the profits that the business generates have continued to rise, the return on equity is really solid, up around uh, you know, almost 40% there. Despite the fact that it's in a, a pretty competitive sort of market, it, it, they've managed to run it in a, such a way that it, it really does well despite what's going on. You know, one thing that I, I perhaps a note of caution, but you know, the Australian dollar has been declining, as everyone knows. Um, for an importer, that's a negative. Their um, you know, costs are going up, but they've managed to counter that by other efficiencies, and so their overall costs actually haven't risen. Now, if this trend continues, with the AU dollar falls even further, and some forecasters are saying that it might get down to around 60 cents, I, I certainly don't know, but if that did uh, play out, that will put some pressure on their future profits, but I think this business has shown that it is a sufficiently resilient business that you know, that may, may have a short-term impact, but in the long term, I, I think they'll, they'll prevail. You can see there that it's uh, earned the um, A1 score, the scaffold score, in, in most of the last 10 years, and indeed consistently across the last four years, and that was reinforced again with the, the report that came out last month about their um, their latest year's results. That's my pick, Shepard. Um, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks about that, Chris. Look, we're almost out of time, so I really just want to take this time to uh, focus on a few questions that we've had from our attendees. But there's a question about moving averages. Uh, Greg, you talked about uh, how you use moving averages. Do you have another example besides CIMIC where you, you found that to be successful? The the other the sector of the market that I've I've been focusing on recently, which has been moving in complete I guess different cycle to the to the main market, is the gold sector, and that's because obviously um, gold prices have uh, been in a bear market for for many years. But ever since the Aussie dollar had come under pressure in late 2014, early 2015, um, and the gold price in US dollars has held up reasonably well, the Aussie dollar gold price has been very very firm, and it's up around about. Well, last week it was $1,600 an ounce, and now I think it's around about $1,550 an ounce, which means most Aussie gold producers are producing um, very good profits at these at these prices, which is unusual for a gold producer because a lot of them are marginal and they've been through a very tough time. If you look at this chart of Evolution Gold, which is a quite a large gold miner, I think it's the second largest in Australia, it gives you a good sense of how the trend is starting to work higher in a lot of these gold stocks, and many of them bottomed. Uh, in 2013, 2014, and they've been moving higher ever since. Evolution, as you can see here. Now, in my interpretation, I would have said this has moved into an uptrend at the start of 2015, and as you can see, the yellow 50-day moving average crossed above the blue 100-day moving average at that time. Mm -hmm. At the same time as that happened, the share price broke out to new highs, um, which was a bullish sign. Um, it rallied all the way up to $1.10 did a standard correction, um, you know, that shakes a lot of people out who don't, I guess, maybe follow trends or don't really believe in the story, corrected back down to below 70 cents very briefly, then rallied all the way back up to nearly $1.30, um, and around that time the, the stock had an, an equity raising, it purchased another mine, uh, and generally after that happens you do see some consolidation and a, the, the uh, indication for me is that gold stocks are interesting to look at now. The next question was about uh, China. It looks like China is a hot topic. Like Chris, free trade agreement with China. Do you think any stocks will benefit from that? Shepard, hard to say at this point in time, but obviously stocks that are, are selling into China are going to benefit from that. You know, there are a number of businesses that are now starting to do a fair bit of business in China. Some that um, some of our listeners indeed have pointed out, Bellamy's, the um, organic food, particularly your baby food producer, uh, Capilano Honey and Blackmores are powering ahead in China and, and they'll benefit from the um, free trade agreement. There's also you know, a lot of talk around the um, funds management sector. Um, obviously Australia has a very uh, good, strong, well-established funds management sector and those businesses may well find uh, opportunities if, if China uh, opens up for them to, to do business there. 
The other question was from Kevin, when should you sell shares? Now, Kevin, we do have a report on our website. Uh, I'll still get Chris to quickly answer that, but we do have a report. Uh, if you go to scaffold.com forward slash free reports, you can actually see the scaffold over if you want to sell shares. But Chris, do you want to just quickly in about 30 seconds or so before we run out of time, just run through that question? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure Shepard. I mean, there's a, we identify five key factors for when you might want to sell shares. The first is when the business's performance is declining. Um, you can see that uh, through Scaffold. There's many ways you can see that, um, particularly the Scaffold score or the, the capital history page that we looked at earlier. Um, if the intrinsic value is declining, that's, that's a key time when you might want to consider selling a share. Also, when a share price has become very expensive. Uh, we, you know, we, we use a, a intrinsic value methodology, and if the share price gets way way above that, that may well be a, a good time to sell. Um, when future growth is looking less promising, uh, you know, I talked about BHP earlier, and that would be one that you know I'm not making a recommendation here, but that would be one that you might have some concerns around. And uh, the last one, of course, is if you only have limited uh, resources, which most of us do. When you've found a better opportunity, that in itself can be a good reason to, to sell something. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Hey, Greg, this one is actually for you. Where do you find moving averages? I just use a free website called www.bigcharts.com, and there's a little side menu, and you can choose what you want there. So um, readily available. You've just got to search around a little bit. All right. Thanks, Greg. And look, we only have enough time for one last question. And uh, it's an MFG question, Magellan. Why have the profits doubled? Do you want to just uh, quickly explain that, Chris, before we sign off? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, Shepard. Um, simple, simple answer is because the business is going really well. So if we pull up uh, MFG here and we go to the capital history screen, you can see that indeed profits have gone really well. They've gone from 82 million up to 173 million dollars. Now, that's basically a reflection of their um, funds under management. So what's happened with Magellan is you know, Magellan earns its money simply through um, fees that it charges on the, the money that it manages on behalf of investors. And so the more money that they're ma managing, the more fees that they're able to charge. They also, on um, uh, many of their funds, will charge a performance fee. So what that means is if they uh, outperform the index that they're measured again, then they can charge an additional fee. Now, their funds under management have been growing very strongly as the, um, the Magellan message, if you like, has been getting out there. In other words, uh, because of their, their past success and, and their reputation as a, as a very well-managed uh, business and well-managed funds, you know, fund managers generating good performance, and you know, consistent to a style. Incidentally, they use a, a value investing methodology, but they do it on a on a global uh, basis. So you know, their their funds under management have increased considerably, which has a direct uh, link through to their profits. Okay, look, we I'll squeeze in one last question, but uh, because we don't have time, I'll, I'll ask to both you, Greg and Chris, and I'll ask for a very short yes or no and a small uh, explanation. It's a question from Simon. Now, will the ASX market keep falling? You know, is there any more risk on the upside or downside? What What's your guys' take? But very, very quickly, if you can. Okay, very quickly. Um, I, looking at the charts again, I think that 5,000 level is very important. That seems to be the level where the buyers are coming in, seeing value in the banks with the yields. I think if we break below that level, then it's telling you that the profit outlook isn't probably as, as rosy as the market thinks, and I think we'll have another another leg down. While we, while we stay above 5,000, I think it gives us a chance to move higher. So um, it's, it's not a yes or no question, and there are I don't think there is a proper yes or no question to that um, answer to that question. Oh, thanks. I, I tried to put you on the spot there, didn't I? <laughs> Chris, what's your take there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm hesitant to make a call one way or the other too because I really have, don't have much of a clue. But uh, I would probably err on the side of it may well go down. Um, I think there's a, you know, a fair bit of uh, challenge in the Australian economy at the moment, which means that uh, profits may well um, be lower in the coming years. Um, and that will impact on you know, 
the share prices. Uh, one of the things that, you know, for those people that really want to dig into it, there's a, a guy called uh, Robert Schiller in the US and, and he produces a thing called the CAPE index, uh, which ref refers to the uh, long-term average PE ratio and that's proven to be a good indicator of where markets might go and, and at the moment that's showing that there's a good chance that markets will go down. Admittedly, that's looking at the US market, not the Australian market. So the Australian market's a bit different. It, it hasn't had the strong bull market that the US has had. But nevertheless, if I had to make a call, I'd be erring on the side of negative right now. I'll, ju I'll just add one more thing to that, Shepard, if I could. Yeah, it, yeah. A lot of that depends on what the RBA does. If the RBA cuts rates, then we could go, could go a little bit higher again. Thanks, thanks for that, Greg. Well, look, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming. Uh, just a very big thank you to our two uh, presenters today, Greg Carnarvon, who's uh, <coughs> founding manager of uh, Daily Reckoning, which is a free subscription uh, newsletter. And also thank you very much to our general manager for Scaffold, who's also a co-founder and the man behind the uh, figures behind Scaffold, that's Chris Bachelor. And to everyone who's not yet a Scaffold member, I will send you an email just to say, say thank you for attending the webinar. You want to have a look at that email. and. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call on 1300 Scaffold or just send me an email at team at Scaffold. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. That's all the time we have for today. Uh, look forward to speaking with you guys either on the phone or via email. Thank you very much. Investing in shares can be rewarding when you do your research, but it can also take up a lot of your time. With so much information out there, how do you quickly sort through the companies worth investing in and those to steer clear of? Scaffold is my research tool of choice. It tracks and reports on all ASX listed companies, plus thousands of global stocks daily, helping me decide which stocks to buy and sell. I can quickly filter through the reports to get the information I need. The rating system is like a set of traffic lights for the stock market. Green is good, orange is caution, and red is don't go any further. Scaffold's top stock choices have been highlighted for their outstanding performance by Money Magazine. With Scaffold doing the work for me, I have the confidence to make investment decisions without having to spend hours sifting through financial data. Now you can take control of your time and your portfolio. Why not take Scaffold for a test drive today?